wonderful name of our Lord. We're going to be focusing again on the I Am's of Jesus in John's Gospel. And so won't you please turn in John chapter 6, John chapter 6, and we're going to take up our reading in verse 25. Uh, a few weeks ago at our covenant service, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, we said that it was this, this is the only account that is given in all four Gospels other than the story of the resurrection. Uh, we spoke about the lad, the lunch, and the Lord. We said that it's not so much uh, what we possess that matters, but that Jesus possesses what we possess. And we said if we put a little lunch in the hands of the Lord, he's able to bring abundant blessing and provision. And I challenge everyone to do that, to put your little into his hands. And this morning we are going to take up the, the, really the aftermath of that miracle. Uh, in between is the miracle of Jesus walking on the water and, uh, and uh, Peter walking on the water as well. And then we come to the heading which says Jesus the bread of life in verse 25. I'm not going to read all the verses uh, for time, but it really is a long passage uh, and uh, uh, we're going to try and get as much out of it as possible. So let's just uh, begin. So let's just start verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, but not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And so they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Quite an amazing statement that. Yeah, they've just witnessed the feeding of 5,000 people and they ask him, what sign are you going to give so that we can believe you? Our ancestors at manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the bread from heaven. In other words, this is not something in the past tense. What I've come to do is to give you the bread that is from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. So if we just move through the passage, they start grumbling because he's now said that he's the bread of life and he's come down from heaven and isn't he just the son of a carpenter and so on. Let's just take up in verse 43. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from me comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. And now let's just continue from verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The 
the flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. And there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. May God bless that reading to us this morning. It's a difficult text. Uh, there's so much content in there and we'll try and cover some of it this morning. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we just thank you for your word. We just thank you that it is sharper than any two-edged sword and we ask that it may just cut deeply into our hearts this morning and, and just re reveal who you are to us as the bread of life. And so speak through your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to kind of skip over a few things uh, this morning from what I did this, uh, at our early service. And I want to really just begin by reminding us of the, the first and the greatest commandment. And that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, okay? Um, so we are to love God with our whole being. Jesus, after feeding the 5,000, comes back to land and the Jews and all those who are following him start to question him on the miracle. And there was a rabbinical teaching, of course, that that someone that when the Messiah came that he would repeat the miracles of Moses and provide manna in the wilderness. And so these people were basically saying if you really are the one sent from God do for us what Moses did. They wanted to see in order to believe. And Jesus actually answers them in a way that shows them that he is the bread of life. The bread of life that is the bread to satisfy the mind, to satisfy the body, and to satisfy the heart. And so I want to look at this passage in those three areas. Firstly to say that Jesus is bread for the mind. Today many people dispute the miracles of Jesus. They say these miracle stories were just legends. They don't prove anything. And ironically, Jesus actually would agree with them. How so? Well, one of the big issues in this chapter is this. When they say, we heard you did a miracle, that means you could be the Messiah. So do it again to prove it to us. How does Jesus answer them? And that's key really for anybody here this morning who is asking the question, how can I know that Christianity is true? How can I know that Jesus is who he says he is? Now Jesus could just have said, look, stand back everybody, let's, let's do the whole miracle again. But he didn't do that. He refuses to do that and here's the reason why. Miracles are not primarily proofs in Jesus' life. Many of those who witnessed the miracles of Jesus never believed in him. In fact, all the miracles in the world would not have convinced them of who he was. And what Jesus is actually saying, if you read carefully, is this. 
They demand that Jesus repeat the miracle so that they might believe. And Jesus says, no. Why? Because I am the miracle. I am the bread of life. So what is the evidence or proof that Christianity is true? Jesus says, it's me. It's not my miracles. It's not my teaching. It's me. I heard of a skeptic who came to a pastor and said, I'd love to believe in God. I'd love to believe in Christianity. If somebody would just give me a watertight case, a watertight argument. And the pastor's response to him is, then you'll never come to him. Because the Bible never gives you a watertight argument. But what it does give you is a watertight person. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus is saying, don't just look at the miracles. Look at me. I am the miracle. I am the bread that you've been looking for. Jesus says there's only one argument that really is proof for Christianity. Look at my life. Look at what I do. Look at what I say. Look at how I live. Because that will challenge your intellect. It will challenge your mind. Because if you truly understood what I said and what I did and how I live, could you really conclude that this is not who I say I am? If you want the evidence for Christianity, if you want to be fully convinced of who Jesus is, friends, you need to read the Gospels. I find it incredulous that there are people out there who do not believe in Christianity, yet they've never ever read the Bible. That's intellectual suicide. It's intellectual ignorance. You cannot say you don't believe if you do not read the gospel account. Jesus says, read it and apply it to your mind and reason it out because you can find me. Love the Lord your God with all your mind as well as your heart and your soul and your strength. I was watching a program that I don't normally watch, just to, so that's on the record. Um, my wife watches it, also not, you know, avidly, but it was on TV, America's Got Talent, okay? So, and on this, one of the programs, I think it was last week, there was this young kid who was doing these absolutely incredible things with cards. I'm sure some of you probably saw it. I think his name is Ling or something. I, unbelievable. He had all these cards, and suddenly the cards were in somebody else's pocket, and um, suddenly the cards all changed color, and he had got cards from nowhere and cards disappeared and it was all, yes, illusion, sleight of hand, whatever it was. But you see, for people looking on, they would say, that's a miracle. How, how on earth did he do that? You see, some might even be able to duplicate some of the miracles of Jesus. That is not the point of his miracles, you see. Jesus says, look at my whole life. The miracle is to get you to see me. I am the miracle. It's not the bread. It's not the fire. It's not the walking on the water. It's not the healing. It's not all that stuff. You don't follow me and worship me because of the stuff that's happening. And how many churches today are full of people who are there for the miracle and the signs and the wonders, but they don't know Jesus. They don't know the person. And when you talk to them about things in Scripture, they don't even know the Bible. They don't know the person. They've completely lost sight of what a miracle is. It's to point people to Jesus. You can account for miracles in so many different ways. But Jesus is saying, you cannot account for me in any way other than who I am. Apply your mind. You don't have to put your intellect aside when you come to faith in Jesus, friends. Jesus wants us to think rationally about who he is. And that is why he says, I am the bread of life. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about who I am. You don't just have to believe glibly and without thinking. I want you to think about who I am. I am the bread for your mind. But secondly, Jesus 
not only demonstrates his power as a sign to engage us intellectually, but he's also bread for the body. And this was a sign of the kingdom that would shape the way in which we live here completely. Miracles were not primarily proofs of Jesus' power. They were demonstrations of his power that were intended to make us think. If they were simply to prove that he was powerful, then in a way he did a pretty poor job because... There are so many other miracles Jesus could have done that would have convinced people more that he was powerful. Think about it. The power that he had, the one who created the heavens and the earth, he put every star in its place. Could Jesus not just do that and a whole clump of trees would just suddenly you know, burn to the ground? Could he not have brought the temple down that it would come down to a pile of rubble? Could he not have flown than just walking on the water and turning a few loaves and fishes into many. So why didn't he? Because his miracles were not meant to be demonstrations simply of his power. There were signs of his presence. There were signs of what he came to do. They were signs of the kingdom of God that was now present among them. And how we can be part of it. Every miracle of Jesus was an onslaught on sickness and disease and poverty and injustice and death. His miracles reveal the extent to which he, like us, grieve over all the suffering and injustice and destruction and death that we have in this world. He feeds the hungry. He heals the sick. He opens the eyes of the blind. He raises children from the dead. He even calms a storm. And we ask, how come God allows so much evil and suffering in this world? And every religion has tried to answer the question unsatisfactorily. But Christianity goes one step further and says there is a saviour of the world. There's a personal God, the great I am, who identifies with his creation, who identifies with suffering, who hates suffering. And how do we know that God hates suffering? How do we know that this was not God's purpose for the world? Because you look at the miracles, that's how you know. None of the miracles were tricks to show us how powerful he was. You remember the story of the, the wilderness when Jesus was tempted. Satan, you see, wanted Jesus to behave in a way that was contrary to his nature. He wanted him to go to the top of a, te of a temple and to jump and to let the angels prevent him from hitting the ground. If he had done that, he would not have been fulfilling his purpose because every miracle Jesus did was to show that he had come to bring a new order, to restore the order of the world. When John the Baptist sends Jesus a message asking how you should know whether Jesus is the Messiah or not. What did Jesus reply? He said, tell him, the blind see, the lepers are cleansed, the poor have good news preached to them. I have come to assault, make an assault on the physical and the social and the spiritual injustices of this world. And you know what the irony is? Is that so many scientists out there who think they are so incredibly intellectual, will not believe the miracles of Jesus because they say they are temporary suspensions of the natural order of things and that they say is impossible. They're temporary suspensions of the natural order of things. But Jesus' miracles, friends, were not temporary suspensions of the order they, in fact, restored the order of things. They restored the order. Jürgen Moltmann, 
who was a great systematic theologian, put it this way. He said, Jesus' healings are the only natural things in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and wounded. They are the only natural things. You see, if you look at miracles as a suspension of the natural order, and you look to them as proofs of who God is and whether you're going to believe or not, you're completely on the wrong path. You will never, ever be convinced of who Jesus is. Jesus came to remind us that this world is not the way it ought to be. That what you see around us with all the mayhem and destruction and disease and suffering is not the way God intended this world to be. The natural order was the way that God created the heavens and the earth to be. In the Garden of Eden, that was the natural order. So Jesus comes as the bread of life to restore the natural order, to restore what, was, what took place in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible says in Revelation there will be a new earth, a new heaven. And that will be the natural order of things. And so every miracle Jesus did was a glimpse of that new creation that he will usher in one day to give us hope so that we will know that this is not all there is. How sad if this world is all that there is. Jesus said that I've come that you may have life. I am the bread of life. I am the miracle. The miracles point to me. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more brokenness. There will be no more disease, no more weeping, no more dying. When I've created the new heavens and the new earth. I am the bread for the body. I am bread for the physical. I have come to restore the natural order of things in this world. But then thirdly, Jesus says that I am bread for the heart. And this is perhaps the most important. Bread for the soul. And so to the Jews' question, what work must we do to earn the special food that you offer? Jesus answers, there's actually only one work that you must do, and that is to believe in the one whom God has sent. After, after asking for a sign so they can believe, Jesus then makes that profound declaration, I am the bread of life. You came down from heaven and gives you life. Not just to you as Jews, but to every living person in this world. God gave manna in the past, that is true, but now he's giving the true manna in the person of me. You see, friends, Jesus did not just come to sustain life, but to give life. Everyone who comes to him will never hunger. Everyone who believes in him will never thirst. And the words believe and come can be used interchangeably. To come to Jesus means to believe. To believe in Jesus means to come. You cannot come and not believe. You cannot believe and not come. You've got to receive Jesus from within, in the same way that you receive food and drink. Just as bread is essential for physical life, the analogy is obvious. Jesus is essential for spiritual life. You cannot have life, friends, without Jesus. You cannot have life by just coming to church. You cannot have life by just reading your Bible. You cannot have life by, by just going through a whole lot of religious loops and jumping through them. That will not give you life. Jesus came that we might have life. You need to be converted. And these claims of Jesus to be the bread of life and that no one basically can have life except through me are so staggering that at the end of the chapter, the verses I read from verse 60, his disciples, not necessarily the twelve, but the disciples who were following him at the time come and say, we can't accept this. This is too hard for us. And in verse 66 we read that many of these disciples left. And Jesus even speaks with Peter and he says, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, who, who else can we go to? 
Even Peter didn't fully understand. And that's why Jesus answers them when they say, we can't accept this. He says, that's why I said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. That's what we in Methodist circles call prevenient grace, that you cannot come to God unless the Father draws you. In other words, God is working in your life long before you ever respond to his call upon your life. That's prevenient grace. You see, friends, everybody has a spiritual hunger. Everybody has a deep spiritual hunger. Beneath your physical hunger is a spiritual hunger that you cannot work for because food just spoils. But Jesus says, that the food that I give you is eternal life. And we try and satisfy that hunger with family and with comforts and social acceptance and money and pleasure and all of these other things. And Jesus says, there's nothing that will fill that void in the human heart. I am the bread of life. I am the only one that you can feed on. I'm the only one that can fill that void in your life. But notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, I've come to give you the bread of life. For then he would just be a mere teacher telling us how to find spiritual life. He says, I am the bread of life. He's saying something that is absolutely unique. Never in history has somebody made such an egocentric claim. In fact, in those six verses from verse 34 to verse 40, no less than 17 times do we read, I, me, my. Anybody else who had said something like that, you would say, you're such an egotist. How can you be so incredibly self-centered? Who do you think you are? And yet Jesus says, I am, I am, my bread. It is me who gives you life. And any other person who did that would have a handful of followers, but Jesus who did that has millions and millions of followers across the world because he's made such an impact on their lives. He's saying, when you come to me, I will give you life. I'm not going to show you the way to life. I'm not going to be a guide to your life. I'm not going to give you a set of rules to live your life. I have come to be your life. When you come to me, you will have life. And on the cross, my body will be broken for you like bread. And Jesus says, only if you come to me and see who I am, not just as a good moral teacher, but truth itself that has come in the flesh. And unless you eat of the flesh, And unlike the Catholic notion that that's a reference to Holy Communion, that we're actually eating the flesh of Jesus, that is not true. What Jesus is saying is that you need to eat the bread. The bread is symbolic of his body that was broken on the cross. And Jesus says, unless you feed on me, unless you take the bread of life into your own life, you will not have life. You don't have to work. All you've got to do is trust the one You came to this earth to give you salvation. When you accept me, Jesus says, God accepts you. I am the bread of life for your mind. I am the bread of life for your body. And I am the bread of life for your soul. Now, how do you respond to that kind of claim this morning? What do you do with a claim like that? Well, if you look at this passage, there were a number of responses. First of all, there were those who simply said, this teaching's too hard, and they left. And maybe among them and among us this morning, there are those of you who say, I can't believe this sort of thing. I can't believe that one person could come to this earth and claim to be bread of life for the whole world. I don't believe that one person could do that any more than anybody else could do that. It's 
It's just, sorry, I can't accept that. You see, I live in a modern age, and in the 21st century, you really expect me to believe something like that? And I would say to you, friends, just to think that you're in the modern world and that you somehow are a cut above those who lived in Jesus' day, that is the most conceited thought that you can have. Because the people in Jesus' day were offended by what Jesus said as much as we might be offended by it today. Because among them there were, there were learned Greeks and Jews and Romans. And yet they walked away. Don't think this is something that you can't accept in the 21st century. It wasn't accepted even back then. And so there may be some of you who say, well, I can't accept that, and so I'm going to walk away. But maybe there are some of you who, who are kind of in between. Maybe you're just hanging on like Peter and the disciples did. They didn't fully understand. They never understood. I mean, G Peter even denied Jesus, remember. So he didn't fully understand who he was. But they hung in. They hung in. And I say to you, if you're there, hang in. Hang in. Because God will reveal himself to you. He really will, not through miracles, but He will reveal to you that He is the miracle and that He can change your life around. But then there may be many of us here this morning who claim to be believers. And like me, every now and again you have doubts. Like me, every now and again you are overwhelmed, just like these disciples were. And you question, you wrestle with some of the claims that Jesus makes. And I would just urge you to look at Philip and the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus comes to him and says, Philip, these people have got nothing to eat. Do something about it. And he said, Lord, what, what do you think we can do? He was overwhelmed. 5,000 people, as we said, probably 15,000 people in all. And all they had was a little boy's lunch. And sometimes God does that to you. Sometimes God puts you. If you feel that you're a good parent here this morning, How many of you men think that you're a good, good father or a good husband? How many of you ladies believe that you're a good wife? Maybe you think you're a bad wife, a bad husband. But how do you, how do you know? You never begin to become a better husband unless you recognize that you aren't one. You never believe you've got to be a better wife unless you first recognize that you may be not a good wife. The 12 steps of AA, they will tell you, the first step is what? We are powerless over our problems. We are powerless over our problems like Philip. We are powerless to feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. We are powerless over our problems. Someone once gave this really good spiritual principle I want you to hold on to it because it is so, so powerful. And yet it's just a few words, but you've got to think about it. When you get out of your nothingness, you get into it. Did you hear that? When you get out of your nothingness, you get into it. In other words, when you stop believing you're nothing and you start believing you something, that's when you really become nothing. When you say, I can do it, that's when you can't do it. When you say, I'm a match for this issue, then you're no match for the issue. But when you concede that you are nothing, that you no match for what lies ahead of you, you no match for this task of being a parent or a husband or a wife or an or a employer or whatever it is, that is when you realize that He is. You may be nothing, but He is not. There's the principle, friends. Get into your nothingness and you get out of it. Get out of your nothingness and you get right back into it. And say, so if right now you, God is showing you that you're a bad husband or a bad wife, it's so that you can become a better one. 
If God is showing you that you're inadequate, it is to make you recognize that you can become adequate in Him. To show you that until you recognize that your little loaves will never do, they'll never do, until you put your little loaves in His hands, the bread of life, and he will start to transform you and help you to become what you aren't. It's not what you can do, you see, friends, that, that matters. It's to put what you possess into his hands and let him do what only God can do as the bread of life. Keith, in his prayer this morning, was talking about confession for all our negativity around what's going on in our country and and it's true, people are worried, people are stressed, people are fearful, uncertain. And you may say, well, from today I'm, I'm not going to worry anymore. I'm not going to worry, I'm not going to be anxious anymore, I'm not going to be fearful anymore. And we sing a great song and we're all pumped up, I'm not going to be fearful anymore. And I want to tell you, that doesn't work. You can say that as much as you want, it doesn't work. Because if you're overly worried today, you can't just say, I'm going to stop worrying. You have to say, I'm making something my life instead of Jesus. I'm making something else my life, my priority, what I live for other than Jesus. Something more important, something in which I pin my hopes my security, my well-being. It may be a person, it may be a political party, it may be whatever it may be. I've pinned my hopes in that and if that comes crashing down, then God help us, then we're all doomed. And that is why you are so anxious because you have not fed on the bread of life. You have not acknowledged that your little in the hands of the Lord can accomplish great things. If you're angry today and bitter and twisted, it's something you've made your life more than Jesus. If you're feeling inadequate, it's something that you've made your life instead of Jesus. And whatever gave you your feeling of adequacy is now just kind of fallen away and now you feel inadequate. Maybe it was your job and your whole identity and everything in your life was based on your job and now that's been taken away from you and now you feel absolutely inadequate and Jesus comes to you, friend, and he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, he who believes in me shall not thirst. Feed on me. Whoever you are, feed on me and you will not hunger and thirst again. And so I ask you this morning, is Jesus the bread of life to you? Have you invited the bread of life to come into your life, to take over your life? As Jess was saying earlier on, have you entrusted everything to him, the bread of life? Or are you still holding on to all these other things that seem to just be like the mist? And when the sun comes up, the mist disappears and you find you've got nothing. And I've said it over and over again, friends, that it's only when you realize you have nothing that you realize you have everything. You have everything because Jesus is the bread of life. Don't look for miracles. Because you can see as many miracles as you want. And I've encountered many people who've seen miracles. And where are they today? They know where. If you don't know the miracle worker, if you don't know Jesus himself, if you don't know the I am, the bread of life, then you don't know anything. And you will never believe. Won't you receive him as the bread of life into your life today? Amen? Let's just bow our heads for a moment. For those of you who 
may struggle with miracles, may think that miracles are somehow proof of who God is, and because maybe you don't see that many, you deny God's existence, and even if you saw them, you're still not sure. Jesus never pointed to the miracle. He always pointed to himself. My challenge to you is to simply go away as Jesus is the bread of life for your mind, to consider his claims. Because as C.S. Lewis said, he is either a madman, he is a lunatic, he is a liar. But if what he said and what he did were actually true, then you have to consider that all his other claims for your life are true as well. And one of those claims is that I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. And so I would just encourage you to go away and explore and to seek his face and you will find him. But perhaps you were in the group of people we spoke about last week, somewhere in the middle, you're still sitting on the fence and God calls you one way or the other way and he says you need to make your choice. By all means, hang in there, wrestle with me, but make your choice. Maybe you're just a believer and you know you've given your life to the Lord but just recently things have gone wrong in your life and you're questioning and you're wondering whether God is there at all and, and God would just come gently to you this morning and he would just say to you that you need to feed on him as the bread of life. You need to be filled on him. Let him answer your questions. Let him draw you to himself. Trust him because he is the God who gives you life. Lord, I just pray for every person in whatever category they may be here today. We thank you, Lord, that in those times of doubt and wrestling, it is then that we seem to be fed the most. It is then that we truly acknowledge our nothingness, and we realize that you are everything. And if it takes that, Lord, to take us to a place of nothingness, may it be so, that we might recognize you as the bread of life, that we might recognize you as the only one that can fill us, the only one who can give us life, the only one that can sustain us in this dark and depraved world in which we live. Lord, may our hopes not be on people. May our hopes not be on governments. May our hopes not be on on economics or anything like that, Lord. May our hope alone be on you and in you. May you become our everything, Lord. May we once again place our little lunch into your hands and see what you can do. We do that for our country, Lord. We do that for our families. We do that for our businesses and work environments. Lord, may we truly trust you as the bread of life this morning. Come and fill us with that life, Lord. Come and fill us, bread of life, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we close this morning, I want to just invite anybody who perhaps hasn't taken that step and you've been wrestling with God and you truly just understand that God is your, is your refuge, that God is the only one who can give you that life. Won't you come forward to the rail, even during the singing of our last song? Just kneel at the rail. There'll be folk who'll come and pray with you. Who knows, maybe even today is that day that you can experience the bread of life for yourself. If there are doubts and you're going through a difficult time and there are a whole lot of things going wrong in your life and you just want prayer and uh, you want to be lifted out of this, this kind of dark pit that you're in, then please come. Like, don't just go home and go through another week of grinding through whatever you're going through. It's, you don't need to. That is why we believe in that God does work miracles. He does work miracles. But he works those miracles so that you can encounter him. Not for the sake of whatever the miracle is, but so that you can encounter him. Won't you please come forward this morning?